This is Keith Morris's memoir or autobiography called My Damage. There was a Black Flag album called Damaged, although he didn't sing in that one. It was Damaged was Henry Rollins, I think. So this this is the cover. This is a portrait by um, Raymond Pettibon, who is the brother of the Black Flag co-founder. And I think that this um, image is intended to look like a bear. So I understand that the bears are part of, are like the assassination teams, but not just assassination. I think that they do control, mind control stuff. Um, and I showed how it looks similar to a still from the Ice Cube video called New Funkadelic. And in the Ice Cube video, it's a, it's a girl, right? And I, New Funkadelic is about sex trafficking girls and also about um, you know I think secondarily about this murder and assassination system and there is allusions to connections with the record industry in that so this guy <clears throat> has done a lot of the covers for SST records uh, and he did the early black flag records including um, my war which shows so this is like, a, I guess this is a, like a conglomeration between my war and damaged, right? My damage. Um, so interesting. It suggests a link between, you know, is it his damage that he's created? Um, his damage or his, war, you know, the war and the damage and all this kind of stuff. I've read this, so, I mean, I can... I have some idea of what it's about. <clears throat> um, but the My War album cover shows, you know, I never really looked at it very closely before. Like, I just didn't get it. It looked like, I was like, this, this is like an ugly, I, I never liked it, I'll be honest. I didn't think it was an attractive cover. But I didn't even never look at it. And I just finally looked at it. I was like, what is this even showing? It's showing a person with a, like a mitten puppet that's a Hitler puppet and the person's hand is holding a knife so the person is holding a knife but their hand is dressed in this Hitler puppet and so it's this idea of somebody somebody's hand basically using someone else's body with a knife to stab someone which is exactly what I've been saying has happened to my daughter's uncle it's exactly what happened to him he was stabbed by somebody who was allegedly racist. It was, I think it might have even been prosecuted as a hate crime. And this guy's family is saying that he wasn't racist in the way that they're portraying, but yet apparently he said racist things um, before he committed this crime. And he was also freaking out because he was scared of the natives. This guy was under mind control, frequency-based mind control. Um, which I think my whole family is under frequency-based mind control, by the way. Um, just like the guy that shot my next-door neighbor. Anyway, so that my war is from like 1980 or 81. It was I think it's from 80. That's how long this kind of thing has been going on. How many people are sitting in prison right now? because they were um, exploited in this way with these mind control weapons. You know, considering if you just go back to 1980, I mean, I'm sure it's probably gone on longer than that. This, this album cover came out in 1980. I don't think this was introduced to the, and how is it the punk rock community, if you want to call it a punk rock community, was introduced to this and, and drawn into this. And one of my big questions has been why are all these people from the punk rock scene dying in Portland, mm -hmm. San Francisco, and earlier it was New York. Like, I read that book. I used to, I read that book. Um, 
Please kill me. That came out years ago. And it, what really struck me is how young all these guys died from the New York punk scene, the early punk scene, like the 1970s New York scene. They died, 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 died. And it wasn't all overdose deaths. And the overdose, the overdose deaths that they did happen, and some of those were obviously assassinations, like Johnny Thunder's death. There's a lot of cancers and things like that, too. And that's exactly what's happening to the punks from Portland, and that's exactly what's been happening to punks from San Francisco, a lot of them. I've been looking a little bit about at L.A. I don't think that's happening with L.A. punks. Now, I look at everybody who ever played with Black Flag. I think they're all still alive. That's very unusual for what I've seen, like a Portland band. So that's weird. Other things, so Pettibon has this, um, I don't really know how anybody's names are pronounced, but um, he has this style. I guess this is, it looks like it's done with, I don't know what this is. It's like, it looks like it's done with paint. And, and there's only, I only see three colors here. I see red, blue, and black. I'm going to close up on that. That's what it looks like, right? Um, so it's kind of like a sketchy kind of style. Um, lots of lines in it and stuff. And you see on his face, these lines, like these, um, almost looks like bear claw marks on his cheeks so he looks like a bear but he's also got a bear claw mark suggesting okay the kind of thing that I'm starting to see which is that this mind control system is a chain people are controlling people who are controlling other people and how far how far down does it go or how far, how long is this chain? Is a question I have. Um, but this is suggesting that this guy, uh, you know, might be involved in doing these direct mind control attacks, but that he too is subject to mind control. That's why <clears throat> one of the biggest reasons why you have to be careful. I, mean, I, I have to be careful about judging people. It's like you can't, it's one thing to judge people in such a way where you're saying this person is dangerous, okay? It appears like Keith Morris is dangerous, is what it's looking like to me. But is he dangerous because he's just dangerous or is he dangerous because he too is being controlled by another force? And I think it's the latter. Um, and you also see this is also shown with the crosshatch marks. Now what does this say? I think it says gun club. It's not clear. I mean, it's, it is. You can tell it says gun club. It, it might say fun club. You know, gun club is an L.A. band. Gun club is a um, band that um, Chris liked a lot. Um, gun club, the singer, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Lee Pierce, died of an, I believe it was an aneurysm. I hear different theories about or different explanations for how he died, but I'm pretty certain it was an aneurysm or, you know, in other words, it was a directed energy shot to the head to the head so I just said that the LA punks weren't dying like like they are in San Francisco and LA but that that's either an exception or it's evidence that I might not be correct but we'll see I, I mean you know if I look into it further maybe I'll, I'll find out whether that's true or not but I haven't seen a lot of that with LA um, like I have with San Francisco and Portland okay so so the implant network, and this implant network appears to be over his heart, or near his heart. It's not entirely clear, but um, so that's what this is showing. I think this is showing the influence of these quote-unquote bears, and um, he looks like a bear, and he looks like he's been attacked by a bear. Also, maybe worth noting, the red emphasis is on his hands and his face. And you even see some of these cross hatches in the back of his tongue.
Here's the dream. Ready, Raymond Pettibon, Keith Morris. Uh, I just wrote that down so I would remember who was in the dream. Okay, Chris gets me a painting kit from Pettibon. There are three brushes, which also seem to be the bodies of animals. Yet Pettibon often colors his art with ink. Keith Morris uses these colored pens to paint an animal hide, like the white deerskin I used to make Brooke's dress. So this is her cere a ceremonial dress. Chris gets me this kit, colored ballpoint pens, white doe skin, or it's given to him to give to me by Keith Morris. Chris already starts drawing on the deerskin with the pens, but it's not exactly Chris. There's a sense of Paul Vega. Paul Vega was our drummer. Paul Vega is from Texas. He played with a band called Wadsworth. Um, he is, Paul Vega is not a person that I like. I find him rapey. I don't like him. Does he have something to do with my daughter? That would be one of the most disgusting things I could imagine. Next to Russ Fritz, okay? There's, there's some of the most creepiest people I've met in my life is coming into here. What the heck? So it's like I use the same piece and experiment with this technique. Morris, who now also seems like he may also be someone else, shows me the technique and how he does it in which he is he uses um, a type of pressure etc that you don't see lines from the ballpoint pen so somehow this is significant that you know when you look at Pettibon's work you usually see lines but Morris is using this technique he applies even steady pressure, etc., so you don't see the lines. There's also a sense of tattooing. I try to follow, imitate his technique. There is a sense that this piece is a practice piece, and I'm a bit disappointed by this. Um, specifically, I'm disappointed that Chris or whoever started it out um, kind of wrecked it for being a finished work. So the first part is sloppy. Other stuff in here I can't remember. So this is kind of what it looks like when I get when I get it. A scribble up here on top that supposedly Chris had started painting there. At the end of the stream, there that's the thing with the Powerpuff Girls. So I'm gonna go back and look that again. So at the end of the stream is the Powerpuff Girls. Blossom says I'm something. Bubbles says I'm something. And Buttercup says I'm 50 to 55 years old. What do you expect? Michelle DiCostanzo, by the way, is the one who introduced both all this stuff to me. Black Flag, Circle Jerks, Dead Kennedys, all those bands. She had their records. She had a bunch of um, Slash. She probably had some SST records too. She had some, a bunch of Slash, um, the label called Slash, a bunch of their records. And she didn't, now didn't. Left, Jeffrey Lee Pierce from Gun Club have something to do with Slash also. Maybe, or maybe he just put out records on Slash. And he was, I guess, the head of the. Um, Deborah Harry fan club or something like that. So that's a possible New York connection. Then after I wrote this down, I, I tried to go to sleep again. I saw hip hop is in the state of 911, this line from Eminem's business or Eminem song business from 2001, the Eminem show or uh, 2002. Okay. Um, more dreams. Ending image is Keith Morris covering the face of a corpse with a fabric with this pattern. It seems like maybe it was a blue colored fabric. So what this pattern is, I mean, it kind of comes out later because I fall back asleep and it reminds me. So there was a, a stuff before this that I don't remember. 
the pattern is linked to another part of the dream. Idea maybe of a spear through a hoop. And somehow this idea of the spear through a hoop, I have somehow linked to the lines in the drawing, like the line. And then um, shoes with this pattern on the soles. So it's like a footprint. So the idea is, you know, Keith Morris covering up this, the face of this corpse that he's wearing these shoes. And that the reason why the prints look like this is because the shoes were, he was walking through dirt or dust. And so it's like a kind of um, displaced. And then, you know, when I draw it, of course, it looks like moons. Or like double, double rings or something like that. Idea of dirt is in here. The other thing that this possibly links to is me at a mud honey show, you know, out in the mosh pit at a mud honey show, and then my pants afterwards, you know, I was laughing about my pants because they were all covered with mud because it was muddy out, and um, something, I had dropped my camera on the floor at some point, and I was crawling around on the floor trying to pick it up, and I had a big boot print on the like, front of my jeans, like people were walking on top of me. It's possible, you know, oh yeah, there's something else about this show that's actually, we'll come back to that. It, it must be a link to that. Okay, so I saw a flash. Colors like the idea of records, CDs, colored dots, colored records, CDs linked to the pattern on the boot sole. Song, mother, mother. Will they put me in the firing line? And as I'm writing this, I'm feeling ener energy shots around my heart. So here's the thing about the show, other than the fact that I was in the mosh pit all night and I had boot marks all over my jeans. Okay, it's it's linked to this. This I Kissed a Girl and I Liked It and this thing about the cherry chapstick. The I Kissed a Girl song I think came out in 2008. This Mud Honey show that I was talking about, I think I was there with, I was there with Sarah Sorensen. Um, I believe that was 2006. There was a girl, a woman, um, up front with me. And so we're waiting for Mudhoney to come on. I think actually Chris played that night. I didn't even, I wasn't really, he wasn't on my radar at that point, um, <clears throat> much. I mean, I had heard of him, but, um, I don't think I really watched his set. So Sarah and I were drinking a lot at first, right, during Chris, probably when Chris was on stage. Um, and then I saw some of the second band was a band called Eight Foot Tender. They had Southern California. They're from Southern California, not they, but at least one of the guys, Greg Odell, I think more than one of the guys is from Southern California originally. And then, um, but has been in Portland for a very long time. And then Mud Honey played. While we were up there waiting for Mud Honey to come on stage, I was right up front with this girl named Linda Kay, a woman. We're both in our 30s at this point, right? We're in our 30s. So her name's Linda Kay. She was from that old Satyricon scene. She said she had met her husband at Satyricon. They had been married since 1990. He was a singing in a, a band called Disciples of Rock and Roll. I don't know if that was his band at the time, but that's one of the bands that he was in in the 2000s. I forget his, his name right now, but anyway, um, so she was there with me and him, I mean, she was there with him and then we were both up next to the stage waiting for Mudhoney to come on. She asked me to kiss her. Okay. I'm drunk by this point. I'm already drunk. Um, I don't know why she asked me to kiss her. It was like she dared me to kiss her. Okay. It was kind of like that. She dared me to kiss her. I don't know why. I mean, she must've said something to me that made me, made it make sense. And I was like, I don't care, I'll kiss you. <laughs> and I kissed her. And then she asked me to kiss her again. She said, with tongue this time. So that was weird. I mean, but I was drunk and I didn't care. I mean, big deal. We were at a rock show and, you know, big deal. Um, I think later on, I feel like I gave her something like a flower. Maybe somebody gave me a flower and I gave it to her. And then I felt bad. I didn't feel bad about the kissing her because she, it was like a dare and it was like a, a silly thing. 
I did kind of feel bad about giving her the flower, and I actually kind of apologized to her. I said, I hope, you know, that hasn't been a problem that I gave you the flower, because she's married and all this. I didn't mean anything by it. I didn't expect to be in a relationship with her. I didn't expect to do anything other else with her at all. Um, and I and nothing else happened. But I wonder if she had been paid to do that. Um, I wonder if her husband was part of that. He ended up dying. Um, a few years ago falling off of he, they were looking for mushrooms like chanterelles or something and he ended up falling off a cliff and dying maybe about somewhere between three and five years ago they had been divorced by this point they got divorced maybe about ten years ago I didn't I wouldn't have ever thought anything about that situation except that Chris started to tell me um, that when he was at Satyricon back in the olden days and he would get very drunk, blacked out drunk, he said, um, he would have these experiences where he, he, there's this guy named Roby who was a musician and um, had long hair and kind of looked like a girl and Roby would get him, would try to get him to kiss him when Chris was in a, in a drunken blackout. And the way Chris described it to me was like waking up from a blackout and realizing he was kissing a man and then being, oh, gross, get away from me kind of thing. Um, that, too, is probably a setup to try to say that Chris was gay. And, um, I mean, to me, like, the way I remember, I remember being a kid and people thinking that, you know, and communicating the idea to me that there was something wrong with being gay. But by the time I was in high school, by the time I was in college, I was over that. I don't, it's weird for me to even think that. And, you know, when my daughter was in school, um, when I was in high school, the kids that were gay around me, there were a lot of gay kids around me, actually. I didn't know it. I wasn't aware that they were gay and bisexual, but um, because they were all in the closet. My daughter went to high school nobody was in the closet anymore and people that she went to high school with ended up not only she somehow like me ended up hanging out with kids that were gay and bisexual but not only that kids that she hung up with hung out with in high school were transsexual I think that these kids are being manipulated with frequency based weapons I think their sexuality is being manipulated I think I think that Transsexual, transsexuality or you know those kinds of you know gender fluidity and all of that kind of thing I think that to a certain degree some of that's normal but I think that there's more of that going on now than is normal and I don't think it's fashion I think it's actually um, children's bodies being manipulated as they grow with these frequency weapons so that's one thing that's going on but then there was also you know so the point that I'm trying to make is it appears that these people who are doing the surveillance okay I have a clue a little bit of a clue of what this is okay it's a fan it's like family lines right these include conservative Christians these include um, people in other countries including Muslim countries these include, um, well, conservative Christians include, like, say, conservative Catholics, who I know don't approve of homosexuality, um, evangelical Christians, many of whom don't approve of homosexuality. Um, I'm sure that there are many um, Muslim groups that don't approve of homosexuality. So that's why it was so important to make it seem like we were homosexual, because they would never, ever, ever, ever approve of us if we were anything other than straight heterosexual people. That's why it was so important. Um, and it's so weird that even the people who are, um, you know, non-binary, non-straight, are involved in setting this stuff up or the surveillance. You know, and there was this woman in the punk scene in Humboldt County named Sherry. Apparently she's been a big architect in this. She's transsexual. She was the first transsexual person I ever had known. Um, 
strange, really strange. But I think that's what, and so Cherry Chapstick suggests that Betty Thompson, I imagine, I, I don't know what Mormons think about um, homosexuality. They probably don't like it either. But that suggests that Betty Thompson was part of this.